Good morning, Year 6, and welcome to Thursday's Book Talk. We've almost finished the book now. It's getting quite exciting and wanting to know what's happening, happening in the end. So today we've got a three-part session with three sentences you're going to build. Um, the first two are quite short because I want us to focus on specific parts of the text. Let's start off by going to the reading rainbow. Okay, so our first reason to read, and we've used this quite a lot, and especially with our English work at the moment, is the feeling lens, this one here. So while I'm reading the first part of the text, be thinking, how does Michael Morpurgo focus, uh, focus on those characters' feelings? And if you were that character, what would you be feeling inside? So we left it here. Do you remember on Tuesday where Billy was busy um, sketching, just waiting for Hitler to arrive and saw the eagle and was busy sketching it and then realised it was too late. He'd lost his opportunity to shoot Hitler. And before he knew it, the dog had knocked him over. And where that highlighted word there is where, where we ended. He was flat on his back in the snow. The dog astride him, not biting him at all, as Billy had expected, but licking his face all over. He still had the pistol in his hand. He gripped it. He could still do it, if only the dog would get off him. But the soldiers were already all around him. Too late, too late. At the last moment, he plunged the pistol into the snow, thrust it down deep, as deep as it would go, and they, they were pulling the dog off him and hauling him roughly to his feet. Why do you think Billy plunged that pistol deep into the snow at that point? Do you think he could gone, have gone through with it if the dog hadn't been in, on him in that way? Moments later, Adolf Hitler was standing there right in front of him, looking him in the eye. Billy knew at once that Hitler recognised him. Neither spoke a word, but for a few moments both stood there knowing one another, remembering. Billy could feel the hardness of his pistol in the snow under his foot. And the way Michael Morpurgo has written that sentence there, what are they remembering? Do you remember? They're remembering when they saw each other face to face at the Battle of Marcoin. Okay, let's stop there and go back to our rainbow. So I think that's a nice point to stop. And we're going to choose the feeling lens. And I want to focus on this one. The author draws attention to. So how are you going to describe that feeling? We know what Billy wanted to do, but was he able to? And how would you explain that? So you can write me a sentence please pause the video if you need to and go back to the text what feeling is being drawn to by Michael Morpurgo answer that for another point can you find evidence from the text and your bonus word is apparent another way of saying it's clear that okay so pause the video this is your first sentence for today okay our second reason for reading today is this green one here, the I, for interrogating facts and opinion. Facts and things we know, which are clear, and opinions of people's thoughts and ideas. Okay, so be thinking of that as I read the next, the next bit to you. The two soldiers had Billy by the arms, gripping him tight. Hitler waved them away, then he simply nodded, turned and walked off. The dog was sniffing round Billy's feet, more interested now in the blood of the hare than anything else. Billy stayed where he was, the pistol under his foot, until they called the dog off. Then he found himself alone on the hillside, watching Hitler walk away, just as he had done twenty years before, and knowing in his heart of hearts as he stood there that he could no more have shot him this time than he had before. And that's a really powerful paragraph, isn't it? If you remember the same kind of scene when he was at the Battle of Marcoin those 20 years before. So we're going to go back to our rainbow.
and the interrogating facts. And this one, the central character, and the central character here, I want you to take being Billy, so it's his story. The central character's opinion is, how can you finish that sentence? What is he thinking? And if you can use that quote in his heart of hearts, I think that's a really nice, powerful way to end this one. So one point for using the sentence starter, another point for ending it. Can you find me evidence for the text for your third point? And your bonus word for this sentence is identified. And this is your second sentence of today. So pause the video, go back to the text if you want to find that quote, and then we're ready to do the last one. Okay, so our final reading section today is going to be a little bit longer because um, I want to finish the, the chapter. We're going to focus on this lens here, the T for trawling for evidence. Do you know what that verb trawling means? Meaning looking for, looking for clues. So while I'm reading it, although you don't know what you're looking for yet, be trying to think, what clues, what can we join together? Sometimes we talk about joining the dots or a penny dropping. So as I read this last bit, you should be being able to piece together, like pieces of the jigsaw, what is Michael Morpurgo wanting us to think? The stranger paused then for a few moments and cleared his throat. Well, that's about it, almost, he went on. Billy came home to Christine and told no one except her where he had been nor what he'd tried to do. She said he tried to do the right thing, but that it would have been the wrong thing had he done it. And he knew she was right about that. So how do you know then if he didn't tell anyone except her? I asked him. Ah, well, that'd be telling, wouldn't it? He said mysteriously. He's a sharp one, your boy, missus. Just like Billy. And you're a Mulberry Street lad, just like we were. That's why I told you all about it, son. Like I said, no one else knows the story, just three of us. And Billy, of course. And he wouldn't mind you knowing. In fact, I reckon he'd want you to know. So how we live on in our stories, right? All down to that ruddy dog, Ma said. I can't believe it. If he hadn't knocked that Billy over, then Hitler might be dead and this whole war might have never happened. Never did like dogs, especially not Alsatians. They's wolves more than dogs. Let's get all a bit of shut-eye, shall we? Said the stranger in the darkness. Only one match left. Better not waste it, eh? Still, you'll manage without it now, I reckon. Be out of here soon enough. Good story, mister, I said. He never replied. We went to sleep then, all of us. I don't know how for how long. The train jolted us awake, and a moment or two later it was on the move. Then we were out of the tunnel altogether, the train driver taking it slowly, I thought, just in case. And I was peer peering up out of the window, looking to see if there were any more fighters up there. There weren't. The clouds were gone too. It was a clear blue sky. And do you remember why they were inside this tunnel? That was it. They were taking shelter, weren't they, because of the German fighter, fighters in the air. Then Ma said suddenly, Where's he gone then? The stranger wasn't there. There was no one in the seat opposite. Ma and I looked at one another. Must have gone to the lab, she said. But the stranger never came back. A minute or so after this, the guard opened the carriage door. Going to be a little late into London, he said. You all right in here? That man was in here with us, Ma said. You seen him? What man? said the guard. It was just the two of you when I came before. Weren't no man. I remembered the hat then that the stranger had put up in the luggage rack by our case. I looked up. It wasn't there. He was here, Ma insisted. He was, wasn't he, Billy? Of course, I said. Of course he was. The guard raised his eyebrows at us as if he were mad. If you say so, madam, if you say so. Now, if you don't mind, I've got a job to do. 
and he went out, sliding the door closed behind them, behind him. Ma and I looked at one another. He told us that story, didn't he? I began. About Hitler, about not killing him in the war when he could have, when he should have, and then about going over to Germany with his pistol to shoot him in the mountains and the eagle and all that. He told us, didn't he? Weren't just a dream, were it, Ma? Ma reached down then and picked up something lying at her feet. It was the box of Swan Vesta's matches. She opened it. Inside were four used matches, one still unused, and that wasn't all. There was a small black pebble and a spent cartridge. She struck the match. Real matches, she said. Everything was real. No dream, Barney. No dream. I'm going to leave it there because that's the end of part four. No matches left. So we're just going to go back to our reading rainbow for the final time. And I said we were focusing on this trawling for evidence. I'd like us to use this sentence starter for our final sentence of this session. We have found a small clue which other readers might have missed that. So in what I've just read to you, what you're going to pick up as the clue as to what's happened, um, what's going on in the story, can you answer it? Can you pause the video, go back and find me a quote to support your answer? So that's three points. And then our bonus word, is hypothesize. So what's your theory? What are you suggesting if you're making a hypothesis and the verb is to hypothesize? What are you suggesting that might have happened? What's your clue? Perhaps it's a clue that's going to tell me that this story is real and it's not a dream. And how do we know that as a reader? What is Michael Morpurgo deciding to include in there that helps us to think that? So this is your third sentence from this session. And then next week, in our final week before half term, we will finish the story. We'll start off the next session with a quiz based on the end of this chapter. Um, and then the end of next week, you can do a quiz on Accelerated Reader with it. OK, I'll see you next week. Thank you, Year 6.